Amen. Man, would you just join me in prayer right off the bat this morning? I just want to just come before the Lord with you in prayer. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Amen. We just declare that his name is above every other name. Every name, every the name of our accuser, than any name, Lord. His name is, is above it. We, we give Jesus praise in this place. We love you, God. Would you just meet us in this moment? Would you meet us as we open your word? Would you speak to us? And would we never be the same as a result? We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm so honored to be back again with you this week. Pastor Mark is, is still on vacation. He's having a great time. He's kind of reached out to us and told us that, which I'm just so happy for him. He, he, uh, yeah, he really deserves a vacation. And in his absence, I just want to start out by saying this right off the bat. A lot of people have like really stepped up because there's a pretty big hole when he, when he leaves. There's a lot that needs to be done. So there's like just four people, though, I just want to especially highlight right off the bat. The first two are Doug and Marlene. They're still working. They're out in the lobby right now. So maintaining social distancing, I just want to say it would be totally appropriate that at, if at, when you see them, you just say thank you. Thank you for all their work because there's a million and two things behind the scenes that are happening that they're taking care of that I just, it's just been so, it's just been such a blessing. And the other two are just Gary and Paul. Gary and Paul stepping up and, le and leading us in worship. Would you actually just, just join with me and just say thank you? It's been so awesome to have you guys lead us and to step up in that way. It's, it's just been so great. So I'm up here again. I'm, I'm so honored to have the chance to open God's word with you. If you were with us last week, you knew we were in Psalm 145. We're headed right back there this week. Um, and we're really latching onto this idea at the beginning of the psalm where David says that I will praise the Lord every day. Isn't that beautiful? It is so beautiful and yet so convicting if you're like me because as much as I hear David say that, it's like, man, I want to be that way. But then I look at myself and I look, if I look at my own history and my own tendencies, man, there's a part of me that just like sometimes wants to question that. You know, like, David, why should I praise every day? Because there's so much going on in our world right now that's so broken and so difficult to deal with. And then we all have our own stuff, right, like, that, we, that sometimes gets in the way. And it's hard. It's hard to be an everyday kind of praising church, everyday praising kind of person. Why should I, we ask. But... We were thankful, right? We can bring this heaviness and we can bring this question to God. And I, I really think David gives us some really solid reasons as to why he chooses to praise every day. He's not just a man of solid resolution. He's got some pretty solid reasons. And last week, we looked at God as our powerful deliverer. God is powerful. And he is not only just powerful, but he's acted on our behalf. It's been really awesome. And we're going we're gonna to look at another reason today. But before I get too far, I want to tell you about a friend of mine named Derek. Okay, so most of you know when I'm not around here at Spotlight, I'm working as a concrete laborer. So what that means is um, when a new building is built, the excavator comes in and he digs a big kind of hole in the perimeter of where the building's going to be. And after he does that, I come in and, and with a crew of people and we, we build the foundation. So it starts out with a footing, just this big kind of slab of concrete on the ground. And then on top of that, we build, we build the, the exterior wall. You actually only see about this much of it on your house or whatever. It's kind of a pain because we really try our best to make that look pretty. <laughs> but anyways, we, that, that's what we do. And um, my supervisor, one of my supervisors' name is Derek. And Derek is... He's not just my supervisor, he's a really good friend of mine. We've been together for three summers. And I want you to do something with me, okay? I want you to think what your typical, like your stereotypical concrete worker is. Okay, like when I say I'm a concrete worker, a construction worker, what comes to your mind? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Gary, I love Gary. Gary's just always there. I say that every week. It's like, man, I always count on Gary. Um, 
here's the deal. Maybe it's like this big dude, big muscles, tattoos all over those muscles, cigarette in his mouth, some choice words, right? That's maybe your kind of your stereotypical construction concrete worker. And listen, in most cases, this isn't that far off, okay? That's not, that, that idea isn't there for no reason. But Derek is, breaks this mold quite substantially, let me tell you. The, Derek went to Laurier for music. Interesting, right? He is one of the most talented vocalists I've ever heard. He's got this deep, rolling, like full voice. Like when he, he, he doesn't sing ACDC or the Tragically Hip. He sings like German classical powerful pieces. It's, in, it's, in, it's absolutely incredible and it's really funny. When I first met Derek on my first day of concrete, we were having this ex exchange, you know, what you, how you do it with people, right? You say, how are you? What do you do? Whatever. So I asked Derek, I was like, or like, what do you do? What do you hear? He's like, well, I'm actually a student at Laurier and I, I actually kind of chuckled internally. Like I chuckled to myself and I think I maybe actually la laughed out loud because what I thought he was doing was I thought he was making fun of people that go to school for music. Makes me sound like a terrible person. Don't judge me. But that's what I, I was like, really? And, and he actually was doing this. He actually was going to school for music. And he, and he turns out to be this most amazing singer. And that same summer, we were on the wall together. We're building this, this big farm bunker, which is like where they store. If you ever drive by a farm and you see those big kind of concrete like places where they put their hay and stuff, that's what we were building. We were up there. And, and he's the guy who's pouring the concrete. So there's this big pump that comes down and there's engines roaring and he's got the end of this thing. It's just like <laughs> concrete's all going in. And he yells down at me. He says, Andrew, what do you want me to sing? What do you want me to sing? And I'm, he's a Christian, really awesome. And I'm a Christian. And at that point, my favorite song was Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Anybody in here know that song? It's a beautiful song. We don't really sing it that much anymore. But I was like, turn your eyes upon Jesus. And all of a sudden, this guy starts belting out at the top of his beautiful voice, he starts singing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. I would try to, to do like he did, but if any of you were as a part of last week's sermon, or last week's service, you would know that I cannot sing. I actually had my mic on the whole first song without, <laughs> without knowing it. I had a lot going on, and I, it, got, it got away from me a little bit. But anyways, he has this beautiful voice, and it's not necessarily what you would think of first when you think of a concrete worker. And I wonder if we almost do the same kind of a thing when we think about God sometimes. What I mean is we have this kind of initial first impression of what we think God is. We have something that comes to mind first. So I say, I say the word God. I say I believe in God or I, I believe in the God of the Bible. I'm a Christian. And, and maybe you have this kind of initial, this is what I think God is like. But there's, there's often more to that. There's more to, the, there's more to that character that needs to be rounded out. And we're going to look at we're going to look at one of these elements of God's character that kind of balances out this idea of power this morning. Because because God is worthy of praise not just cuz he's powerful. There are there are so many reasons to worship him because of who he is. And we're going to we're going to see what that might be this morning from Psalm 145. So if you want to turn there with me this morning, we're going to read the whole thing again. Um it's 21 verses. So I said this last week. If you're somebody who's on the fence about pulling out your Bible to follow along, I'm going to be reading from the NLT. Um, but listen, however is best for you. If you're somebody who can just sit and you can hear me read and you can follow me all the way through, then that's great. Then do that. But if you need some help, feel free just to op open your Bibles, turn them on. We're going to be in Psalm 145. Psalm is right in the middle of the Bible. If you're, if you're not aware, it's, you just kind of open it to the middle and your chances are you'll find it. And it's near the end of the book. Psalm 145. The word of the Lord says this. I will exalt you, my God and King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. 
your majestic, glorious splendor. Isn't that what you were thinking of when, when, when Gary was reading that scripture this morning? Just the whole of heaven just bowing before the Lord, praising Him day after day. Your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. I will proclaim your greatness. Everybody will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. The Lord is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all his creation. I don't know what your drive-in was like this morning, but I, was, I left my house and it was just like torrential rain. And I was thinking, man, I am so thankful that the Lord showers his creation with compassion. All of your works will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers will praise you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom and they will give examples of your power. They will tell of your mighty deeds and about the majesty and glory of your reign. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and you rule throughout all generations. The Lord always keeps his promises. He is gracious in all he does. The Lord helps the fallen and he lifts those bent beneath their loads. The eyes of all look to you in hope. You give them their food as they need it. When you open your hand, you satisfy the hunger and thirst of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in everything he does. He is filled with kindness. The Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, all who call on him in truth. He grants the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries and help for help and rescues them. The Lord protects all those who love him, but he destroys the wicked. I will praise the Lord, and everyone on earth will bless his holy name forever and ever. Was there anything in there that you felt like maybe offset it or, or, or complemented this idea of power. Power is there over and over and over again, but there's something else I think that David just has in his mind as a reason for why he will praise every day. And I think it's this. The Lord is merciful and compassionate. Slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. Not only is God our powerful deliverer, he is also merciful and compassionate and filled with unfailing love. So this is that second reason. We're going to be coming around this idea of the fact that our God is not only powerful, but he is also merciful and compassionate. And you know what I find is really interesting about this? Is this phrase that the Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. David is not the first person to say this. This is actually a verse that comes up again and again and again in the scriptures. And do you know where the very first place is? The very first place, because there is a first spot where, where we hear about this. The very first time we hear that the Lord is merciful and compassionate is actually back in Exodus. That's where we were last week, and that's actually where we're going back to again this week. And, and the very first time we hear that the Lord is merciful and compassionate is in the story of the golden calf. So hands up, how many of you have heard that story? How many in the room have heard the story of the golden calf? Um, listen, it's, it's kind of another one of those stories that, um, that we hear for the first time as kids, and maybe it's been a long time. Maybe it's been years since you've been in Exodus or heard this story or been brought to mind. Um, but I'll just say this is not just a kid's story. This is an adult story. This is a powerful story. This is, an, a, story, this is a story that we need to hear because God wants to speak to us through it. 
So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about it. I'm just going to go through it quickly. So the first 15 books of Exodus, we kind of talked about last week. We didn't read them all. We didn't go through them all. But the first 15 books of Exodus are all about this idea that God delivered his people from this horrible tyrant named Pharaoh in Egypt. And it all had to do with his plagues, that God would show his power in the world through this deliverance. And there's this final moment where the Lord just powerfully leads his people right through the sea. He opens the, he opens the sea, water on both sides, the people go through, the enemy is drowned, and the people are set free. And it's just this amazing moment. It's, it's, when you're reading those first couple of chapters, it's just like boom, 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 boom. It's amazing. It's this fast-moving story. And then for the next 15 chapters, it's kind of slow. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's been in Exodus or if you've read it in a while, but Exodus 15 to 31 is kind of slow going. And the reason is, is because there's lots of laws and there's lots of building plans. It's really interesting. Exodus 15 to 31 is a building blueprint for a very special tent. It's a tent known as the tabernacle. It's kind of a word we don't hear very much anymore. But what this is, is a tent where the Lord would meet with his people. It was supposed to be right in the middle of the people, which is so significant. This, this place where the Lord would dwell with his people right in the middle of their camp. And now everything is going relatively smoothly until we get to Exodus 32. And that's where the story of the golden calf comes in. So at the beginning of this story, Moses is up on the mountain with God. So these building instructions are being given to Moses, and it's, it's taking a while. How many of you like to wait or, or have a hard time waiting? Anybody have a hard time waiting in the room? Yeah, I, I don't like waiting. Um, last night, actually, I was, we, were watching a, we were watching something online, and our internet was a little bit slow, and we had that little... And I was like, oh, you know what I mean? And I only had to wait just a little bit, but it was, it was bugging me. But anyways, the people in this story didn't like waiting either. Listen to how the story begins. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Aaron is Moses' right-hand man. Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who had brought us here, up from here, out of the land of Egypt. Make us some gods. This is horrific if you've read the whole book of Exodus because the whole beginning of it is how there is one true God who has shown blessing and favor on this one people, liberates them from their horrible slavery through power and wonders, and he's with them and he's faithful to them. And the first second that he just seems to be taking a little bit longer than he should, the people abandon him. It's awful. It's like how, you're reading it and you're just like, how could you do that? Like, what are you doing? Just wait. Like, you have no idea what the Lord's going to do. But they don't and they get tired of waiting. And so they go to Aaron and they say, you know, we're tired of waiting. We want you to build us some gods who we can worship. And Aaron does it. And it's so, like, it's just, it's so tragic because the scriptures say very specifically that to build this thing, they needed something to build it. So Moses says, well, take the gold jewelry that you have in your ears and bring it to me. And a while back at the beginning, the Lord says to his people before they leave Egypt, he says, you're not going to leave empty handed. I'm not just going to deliver you. I'm just going to, I'm going to deliver you with the blessings of Egypt itself. They will give you their jewelry. And that same blessing, that same goodness that God showers on his people, they say, well, we'll just take that and make a God for ourselves in his place. And so they make this calf and they set it up and they begin to worship it, which means they begin to offer sacrifices to it. They begin to give of their resources to it. And then they also take part in some really awful um, rituals for worship that we're not going to mention this morning. It's pretty gruesome, but um, it's brutal. And now God's not blind to all of this. We have to remember this too. So God is up on this mountain with Moses, giving him the instructions for the tabernacle where he's going to dwell with this rebellious people. And he knows what they're doing. And he is furious. Listen to what the Lord says. The Lord told Moses, quick, go down the mountain. Your people whom you brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. How quickly they have turned away 
from the way I commanded them to live. They have melted down gold and made a calf, and they've bowed down and sacrificed to it. They are saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Then the Lord said, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them and I will destroy them. Then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. Leave me alone so that my fierce anger can blaze against them. I just want to pause because I don't think we can just move past this too quickly. For those of us who have heard this story, I know there are people participating who have heard this story. We know that it doesn't stop here. But at this point, we need to know how serious our God takes sin. It deeply affects God when we sin. He's not this kind of unmoved, unaffected, it doesn't really matter kind of a God. It's, it's cut him right to the core. And we need to know that. We need to know how serious this is. And what God's first intention is to do is to destroy the people and start over through Moses. But Moses stands in the gap. And what we actually have over the next couple of chapters is Moses doing this over and over again. It doesn't just happen once. It's so, it's, it's a, I would encourage you, if you have any time today just to read your Bible, just to read this story through, Exodus 32 to 34 is where it's all found. And over and over again, Moses comes and he intercedes for the people and God listens to him. And the first way he listens to him is he doesn't destroy them. Um, and he doesn't because Moses does something very profound. What Moses does when he goes to the Lord is he actually brings up the Lord's character itself before the Lord. He basically says, you need need to know who you are. Listen to what he says. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You bound yourself with an oath to them, saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven, and I will give them all this land that I have promised to your descendants and they will possess it forever. He's basically saying, you promised. Saying, you promised. You can't just do this. You can't just destroy the people because you promised, and I know you're faithful. And the Lord listens to Moses. He did not have to. God can do what God wants. We have a hard time with that sometimes. But God can do what God wants, but God listens to Moses. He does not completely destroy the people, but man, there are some serious consequences for the sin. Um, Moses gets sent down the mountain. God's not going to destroy them. But when Moses sees the scene, you've got to imagine this. Moses has a firsthand glimpse of all the plans that God has for his people to dwell right in their midst. And he sees them worshiping this calf, which is like one and two of the commandments they're not supposed to do. And he takes, God was writing these intentions in stone. This was, a, as scripture say, it was written by the hands of God. And Moses takes these stones and he just throws them right to the ground because it's shattered. People have broken the covenant. And he's furious with the people. He takes this calf and he grinds it up. I don't know how he did it, but he grinds it up really finely and he makes the people drink it. That's what he makes them do. And then, this is really horrific, but 3,000 people are killed for their actions as a result of their worship to the calf. 3,000 people are killed, and there's also a brutal plague that strikes the people. Now, I don't know how this makes you feel, but this is really uncomfortable. (laughs) This is a really uncomfortable part of the story. This is the kind of stuff in the Bible that makes people go, I want nothing to do with it, when you read stuff like this. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for a long time. I found this uncomfortable this week. I was wrestling with this. I was like, really, God, like, was that fair? Is that fair of you to do? And then I began to realize something. Like, I wonder if the problem isn't with the story. I wonder if the problem is with me. I wonder how blind I am to the seriousness of my own sin. 
Humans are great self-justifiers. I don't know if you're like me. I'm like this. I don't know if you've had this little voice in your mind before that says something like, oh, it's only that one time. Oh, nobody's really going to get hurt. I'm not really that bad of a person. I just need a break. Life is so hard. I just need, a, I just need an escape. No, oh, I'll change that next week. I know it's bad, but, you know, like we are, we are great at this. We are great at justifying sin. But I think this story is meant to be a wake-up call to us to be like, sin is serious. Sin has serious consequences. It deeply affects God. If we only could have eyes to see the glory and the goodness and the mercy and the plans of God for us and the effects of what happens when we go against that, when we say, Lord, I don't want that, actually. I want to do something my own way. I'll take your blessings and I'll make them into whatever I want to make them into. If only we could see what that is actually doing. Our sin pains and angers God's heart, and we can't miss this. But we also can't stick here because the story does move on. So the story moves on, and what happens is, is Moses repeatedly advocates for the people, but he does something really cool. There is something in particular that he advocates for. He, he begs the Lord that the Lord will not withdraw his presence from the people. Remember everything to do with that tabernacle and all of those plans to dwell with them? Listen to what God says to Moses. He says, get going. You and the people you brought from the land of Egypt, go out to the land I swore to, the, to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I told them I will give you this land to your descendants, and I will send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to this land that flows with milk and honey. But listen to this. But I will not travel with you. For you are a stubborn and rebellious people. If I did, I would surely destroy you along the way. God says, you can go to the land that I told you that I would give you, but I am not going with you. Man, this story is tragic. This story is heartbreaking. But there is one bright spot in this story all the way through, and it's so amazing. And it's the relationship that Moses has with God. Because even though the Lord is furious with the people, and rightly so, his favor has not left Moses. There's this really kind of cool meeting place that they have. It's, it doesn't have that creative of a name. It's called the Tent of Meeting. The Tent of Meeting. And the Tent of Meeting is not in the middle of the camp. It's not with the people. It's outside the camp. Very important. And listen to what the scriptures say the relationship Moses had with God was like. Inside the Tent of Meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks with a friend. Isn't that so beautiful? Man, in, this, in these times right now when we, are in, when we have been isolated from each other and there has been this lack of, of social connection, I don't know how important your friends are to you, but man, they're important to me. I need my friends. Do you know what I mean? I, I call them. I've become very good at long distance relationships. I call people and I just want to talk to you and I just want to say, how are you? And that's because there's this kind of special connection we have with our friends. And that's the, that's the kind of thing that the scriptures say that Moses has with God. It's so beautiful. So we have, in the middle of all this brokenness, we have this one person who has ties to the people, but he also has ties to God. And he is standing in the middle, pleading for reconciliation. One person with ties to the people and ties to God, standing in the middle, pleading for reconciliation. This is important. And God says to Moses about his presence. So this, they're, in the, they're in the negotiations here about what's going to happen with the people and God. And listen to what God says. I will go personally with you, Moses, and I will give you rest, and everything will be fine for you. 
But Moses is merciful and compassionate. And God is merciful and compassionate. And listen to what Moses says. If you don't go personally with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me and on your people if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. Do you know what the Lord's reply is? I will indeed do what you have asked. For I look favorably on you, and I know you by name. The Lord listened to Moses. He did not have to, but he did. Because he is merciful and compassionate, and we now come to the place, the very first part in the scriptures, where the Lord reveals to Moses who he is. Listen to this. Yahweh the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love on a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. But I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins on the parents of, of the parents upon their children's to the third on the sorry on the children and grandchildren the entire family is affected even children to the third and fourth generations Now listen I know this is a bit of a long story we've been talking a lot about one thing really appreciate that you're all with me but there's a few things I just want to say here about this story that I feel like God wants to say to us the first thing is that even though maybe Spotlight Church, we haven't built a calf or individuals here. We haven't built a calf per se. But every single one of us in this room has taken what God has said is good and we thought we could do it a little bit better. We thought we could do it a little bit around what God wanted. We thought we could take what He has given us as good and we could do it how we want and produce what what ought not to be produced. We've all done that in some way or another, whether that be sex, whether it not be food, whether that not be the authority that you have in whatever place of life, you know, place you are, in relationships, in your marriage. We all have this tendency sometimes of taking what God sees as good, gives us, and going against Him, against how He's commanded us to live. And as a result of this, there are serious consequences for us. When God forgives us sin, it doesn't mean that there's not consequences in your life. I'll just be the first one to be honest with you in this room. There's a season in my life where I thought God should be a little bit more flexible on what he said about sex. I thought that he was a little bit too strict. And I thought, well, I'll just, make a, I'll just take that gift and do with it what I want to do with it. And I want to tell you that there have been some serious consequences for that in my life. In my marriage... There has been deep healing that God has had to do as a result of that and still is doing. But here's the thing. In the same way that the killing and the plague was a consequence, the biggest consequence for us is that when we sin, we're separated from God. Listen, we have a desire as humans to have this beautiful communion with God. We hunger for Him. There's this, there's this church father who said once that, we are restless until we find our rest in Him. We feel that. But sin is the thing that breaks that, makes that not possible. Which means that we need an intercessor. We need somebody with ties to us and an ear with God to stand in the middle and negotiate reconciliation. And let me tell you that the gospel is that we have one. Amen? We have an intercessor. When Jesus was baptized, God's voice came thundering from heaven and he said, This is my son, with in, <laughs> this is my son whom I love, and with him I am well 
pleased. And let me just tell you that the relationship that a father has with a son is infinitely more close and significant than the one that one has with a friend. I know there are there's stories of terrible fathers that, that have done some terrible things for their family, but when things are right, there is nothing more significant than a relationship that a father has with his son. And we see it right here. This is my only son with whom I am well pleased. And this only son, when he went up on a mountain, he asked his father to forgive those who had put him there. And I want to say this morning that the father listened to him. The father listened to him. And as he died, Matthew says in his gospel that the curtain that, that separated the presence of God from the people was ripped in two. That our, our Jesus, our advocate, went through and made possible the presence of God for us. And right now, as we sing and as you hear me speak, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God doing the same thing. He is interceding for us. He is putting in a good word for you. He is advocating for you. He knows your name and he's, he's, he's putting in a good word. He's, he's making it possible for the presence to be with us still. Now, I don't know where this lands you this morning, where this hits you, but I want to remind you that Jesus is advocating for you. He is your advocate. He is interceding for you. And this is so significant, especially for worship. And here is why. I don't know if, if, if this is the case with you, but there are, there are like two reasons why we don't worship. I think one is, I think one reason we don't worship is from the outside, what's going on in the world, what's going on in our circumstances. But I think there's another one that really affects us right in the heart, and that's what's going on inside. There's things in us that cause us not to worship. There's this feeling of, just not feeling worthy to worship. I don't know if anybody feels that in this room, but, but for me, my experience, if I could put it into a picture, is like high jump. Do you know what I mean? Like sometimes when you watch the people put, they jump over the bar. For me, it's like, for me, I give myself permission to worship when I jump over that bar, but I always seem to put it higher than I can jump over. If that makes any sense. And here, here are the reasons why I can't jump over it. Not enough Bible reading this week. Not enough prayer this week. Not enough time with your kids this week. Not enough good enough time. Not enough. God, not a good enough job this week. Not enough. Accuse, 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 accuse. And I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's like I shouldn't have said that word this week. I shouldn't have looked at that thing this week. I shouldn't have. And there's all of these reasons we have for for why God would not want to hear our worship. Why the presence is gone. Why God would just withdraw our presence. And I want to just say, does that sound anything like the God we've been reading about, or anything like the Jesus we've been talking about? Jesus is not that way. He is advocating for you. He wants your worship. He wants God's presence to be in our midst. He is advocating for it. He's not up in heaven going, oh shoot, they said that. Hope they don't worship this week. He says, I know you. You are mine. You belong to me. I'm not withdrawing my presence. Now this doesn't mean, this doesn't mean that we just get permission to live any way we want to. Goodness, we believe, we believe at our core that if you belong to Jesus, there is a once a way we used to live and it was under our old master and we believe that when we follow Jesus, we follow him out of that into a new way of living. In actuality, we believe we change. We believe that God empowers us to live differently. But that journey from who we once were to who God has called us to be is one that we really need an intercessor on. I don't know if that's, if that's just me, but that is, I need an intercessor. I need someone that knows who I am and is, and is pleading my cause and, and, and keeping me with him the whole way. And we have one. I would like to ask the band to come back up right now if, if, if they'd be able to. Um, so this morning, Jesus is your intercessor and he looks at you with eyes full of compassion. I want you to know that deeply this morning, that, that he calls you, he's, he, he desires our worship. He does not sit there and wait for perfect people to worship him. 
He advocates for us, He is for you. And we need to be every day kind of praise. You know what I love? Is that we often know this. How many of you have heard the verse that the mercies of the Lord are new every morning? Isn't that true? The worship, the mercy of the Lord is new every morning. And if that is the case, that that is the kind of mercy he has for us, then we ought to be a people that responds with everyday praise. We ought to be a people that praises him every day for that mercy and does not let that mercy go unnoticed. Would you pray with me? Father, we just praise you this morning for your, for your infinite mercy and compassion on us. Father, I pray that every heart that is participating in the service would just know and know that you are compassionate. God, you are so compassionate and merciful. And Lord, we will not take that for granted. Thank you for your love, Jesus. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your intercession on our, on our behalf. Thank you, God, for being merciful and compassionate. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.